Awesome. Well, it's good to be with you guys this morning. It's always uh, an honor and a privilege to, to preach on a Sunday morning. I have to clear the air before I start. People are asking me, what in the world is up with the shirt? So I got to tell you, I, uh, this is one of my shirts that I preach overseas and all the time. And you'll see this picture behind me is actually the last time I wore the shirt. And what's going on in the picture is I just arrived in Indonesia and they put a crown of honor on my head. But you don't see in this picture is then they smeared me with pig fat, which was absolutely disgusting. But I didn't get any mosquito bites that day because the pig fat keeps it away. Uh, and the reason I have the up close shot on it is I don't want to show you all the people because most of them aren't wearing clothes when they put the crown on my head because I like going into the areas where it's just uh, is as far in the bush as you can get. And so um, it's a lot of fun. So if you ever get a chance, it's worth it. And so that's, uh, I'm, pre I'm preaching in the shirt because I keep thinking about the day, which is going to be soon, that Faith and I fly back into Tanzania and do a huge meeting. It's going to be in May. So we're excited about that. And uh, so that's why I'm wearing the shirt is to keep my, keep me focused on, uh, on, on doing that. And so anyway, it's good to be, uh, good to be with you. Um, I got I to gotta make a confession. And my confession is this week uh, during my lunch break, I was uh, in the car, and I was driving to get a coffee, because those of you that don't know, I'm totally addicted to caffeine, especially coffee, and uh, so I'm driving, I'm listening to the radio, and I'm just starting to get depressed. You ever listen to the radio, or you watch TV, or you spend 35 minutes scrolling, and your legs start to get numb because you're sitting in a chair scrolling through Facebook, and you just get totally depressed. Does anybody ever do that with me? A couple of people that are honest, the rest of you. You don't watch enough TV, which is a good thing. And so, you, you know, you can get so caught up on all of the things going on, whether it's people fighting or, or people slamming each other for other reasons. And I was scrolling through Facebook, and it's just a, like there's this one thread that I follow on Facebook. Now I just follow it for entertainment because it's just one person attacking the other, and it's just like, what in the world? And it could be entertaining, but it's sad at the same time. And then I watch on, and I, and I think about all of – my fellow Americans are stuck behind enemy lines, and I just get angry. And then I think about, like, all of these other things, and if you, you just go, start to go crazy thinking about it all. And then, this week, I ran across the most beautiful scripture, which, which says in Acts 8.8, 8, there was great joy in that city. There was great joy in the city. Well, why don't you look at your neighbor and say, joy. Just look at him and say, joy. Because... Somewhere along the line, we have missed the joy. Does anybody like to have joy back? Anybody like to have the freedom back? Anybody, anybody like to feel like when they walk down the street, it doesn't matter what's going on because there is joy. But the scripture tells us there was great joy in that city. And so that's what this message, this ain't it, is about, is about how to rediscover the joy in the middle of the turmoil, in the middle of the craziness, to rediscover the joy. You know, I, I had a couple people message me this week and some text and some did it on Facebook and they messaged me and they said, hey, why do you always preach the gospel? Like, it's the only thing you ever preach. And I got to thinking about it and I started to think, well, what else is there to preach about? And so, like, between you and I, if, if it sounds like all of my messages kind of end the same way, it's, it's done on purpose because to me, there is no other thing worth preaching about other than the fact that Jesus died, rose again, and he lives today. But, but it's so far and few between. That's why I believe people are like, why is that all you preach about? That's all I preach about because that's what I see that works. It's because I've, I have seen it work all, with, with young people, with old people, because it's the only message God promises to back up. And so this morning, when I talk about there was great joy in the city, it's going to be a gospel-based message. Because in Acts 8, 4, it tells us, why there was joy in the city. It says in, in, in Acts 8, 4, it says, those who had been scattered preached wherever they went. They preached the message wherever they went. If, if you back this up and you look at it, you see that why were they scattered? Because there was persecution that came against them. Acts 1 tells us that they were persecuted and that uh, uh, Saul, before he became apostle, Paul was going around killing everybody that was a Christian. And so there was great persecution, and so they spread throughout. They, they were scattered. I want you to think about that today we're starting to see the beginning of persecution for the name of Jesus. I've witnessed a lot of the persecution firsthand where, 
where I've seen, right in front of my eyes, I've seen buildings up in flames. I've seen people riot over the gospel. I, I've seen people march and protest, shouting other religious things at me, which made me so scared I wanted to ca crawl into a, a cave and just hide. And, and there were times that I had to just ask God, oh God, help me get through this. But in the middle of all that, we're starting to see that piece by piece, even in our own society. Think about that. No matter what side of the aisle you fall on, I'm not saying which side I fall on or which side is right. In fact, I don't think either side is right all the way. You see that no matter what side you go on, all of a sudden there are things that both sides start to neglect about what, what biblical principles are. So no matter which way you go, persecution is coming. Cancel culture is coming to cancel Jesus. I can promise you that. All you got to do is scroll through TikTok, and you see people talk about how Jesus is racist, Jesus is homophobic, Jesus is not inclusive, and all of a sudden I start to think to myself, they're coming to cancel Jesus. So persecution is in the mist. The, 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 the seeds are there for persecution to happen. But the good news is when persecution happens, the enemy always means to destroy the gospel, to destroy the message, but all it does is elevate the one who the message is about. Persecution always pushes people to the truth. And so we see this, that at Acts 8, 4, no matter where they went, where they were scattered, they preached the message. So the question becomes, what message do they preach about? Because I'm not sure if I listen to modern American church culture, I don't know what message I should be preaching. Do you know what message is the true message by listening to modern church culture? Because I don't think you can know. Because one person says this, one person says that. This church is all about worship. This church is all about prophetic. This church is all about the anointing. This church is about blowing the shofar so that the demons flee, even though I don't know where they get that. This church is all about the third temple has to come, even though why would you want the third temple to come? Because that just means they're going to sacrifice animals again, proving what Jesus did to be worthless. And so all of these things happen. This church is about how you have to pray against the devil, even though the devil's already defeated. Every church wants to say something else. This starts to get confused. When in fact in Acts 8 5, it tells us what the message was. Look at this. It says this in Acts 8 5. It says, Philip went down to the city in Samaria, and what did he proclaim? He proclaimed the Christ there. He proclaimed Jesus. He proclaimed that, 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 that the Messiah for everyone was died, buried, rose again, and he still lives today. That is the message that Philip proclaimed. He proclaimed Jesus. And so in the middle of this, we see what happens when Jesus is proclaimed. And before, you start to think, wow, this is just some evangelistic message. It doesn't really have anything to do with my life. It doesn't matter if you're in business, finance. It doesn't matter what you're staring down in the face. It doesn't matter what your family situation is. It always comes back to what do you stand on and what do you believe. And as Joshua said, I don't know about you, but for me and my house, which is only faith right now, but we're about to add on, don't worry, the kids are coming, baby, and they're going to be beautiful, and they're going to be the president, just like Barack Obama. And so all of a sudden, we, we are going to stand on the Lord. We're going to stand, and we're going to serve the Lord. And who's the Lord? Jesus, because of his gospel. That's what we're going to stand on. What are you going to stand on? So we see that the gospel is preached. And then, Acts 8, 6, and 7, look at what it says here. It says this in Acts 8, 6, and 7. When the crowds heard Philip, keep the scripture up there. Do you ever notice every time in scripture that Jesus is around or that Jesus is preached, the crowds come? But if you look at charismatics and Pentecostals and non-denominational people, they go to the crowds where the anointing conference or the prophecy conference or the healing conference is. But the world doesn't crowd around all that. You want to know why? Because the world doesn't care. They care about the truth. They care about Jesus. So whenever Jesus is lifted up in Acts, whenever Jesus himself speaks, there is never a time that a massive crowd does not surround them. I can tell you firsthand that if we go into a, into a town in the middle of Tanzania and I start to preach then all of a sudden the crowds come. I know part of them come because they're saying, what does this huge white guy have to say? Because he's the only one around. And then some of them are just saying, what's going on? But it's true. I can give the microphone to any person, including somebody from there. If they start to preach about Jesus, the crowds begin to come. Why? Because crowds are attracted to truth, which is the gospel. And then it says, and they paid close attention to what he said. He said and he talked the gospel. And then miracles happened. 
You see, if you're looking for something to shift, if you're looking for something to change, if you're looking for the normal to change in your life, if you're looking for, 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 for something different, it, what are you doing right now that's not working? Just, just I, for, for the next couple moments, I want you to try to get rid of everything you've been thinking about. I want you to, and I want you to just hear me out. When you focus on Jesus alone and nothing else, that is when the miracles break forth in your life. It's that simple. And then that's why Acts 8.8 8 says, there was great joy in the city. There was great joy because Jesus was lifted up, and when Jesus is lifted up, joy has to come. That's why Acts 4.12 says that there is no other name by which we must be saved. There is no other name by which we must be saved other than Jesus. We can say that there's no other name by which you're healed. There is no other name by which you're set free. There is no other name by which your family comes together. There is no other name that restores you other than the name of Jesus. It's beautiful. Now, now people get excited about this, but, but, if, but if I could just be honest... We and the American, North American church have been duped for something that is not even biblical. We have settled for the message of Christianity without the person of Jesus. We've settled for a message without the gospel. We have served for, we, we've settled for the ways to receive healing without acknowledging that the gospel is all we need. We, we've, we've acknowledged that the 14 steps to deliverance, even though none of those steps are in the Bible other than the fact that in the name of Jesus, come out, you devil. But somewhere along the way, we have settled, and Apostle Paul knew this was going to happen. Look at Galatians chapter 1. It says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and turning to a different gospel which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. This is true in the church world, and this is true politically. The political world, as well as a lot of people in the church world, have so distorted Christianity just so that they could get ahead or make a buck. If I hear another president one more time talk about God's will for doing what they did in a country such as Afghanistan. That's not Jesus. You know what is Jesus? The fact that he loved the world, died, rose again, and he still lives today. That's Jesus. A political motivation is not Jesus. Uh, no, no, no. I, I'm getting going a little bit. So, you see, this is, this is the problem. This is why you got to tell Zach not to take the pulpit away. Because when Zach takes the pulpit away, I don't have my notes with me. I, actually, my notes, my, my notes are right, right here. So, none of this is in my notes. But that's good because I like to just preach from the heart. And so, in the middle of it, this is what I want to say. How many times are we going to buy the same book from the same preacher with a different edition so that they can line their pocketbooks and live in Beverly Hills driving a Cadillac so that they can live well, but we can be stuck and there's a religious bondage? Because unless they preach Jesus, get rid of it. I used to be timid, but after what I've seen, I can't unsee it. I cannot talk about it. Jesus needs to be the center, and Paul knew this was going to be a problem. I know, but, but America is a Christian nation, right? Well, hardly. Check out this uh, from Arizona Christian University, August 2020. It says just 20% of people, these are people that they, that they asked, these are people that claim to be believers. Just 20% of people age 18 to 29 believe that when they die, they will go to heaven only because they've confessed their sins and have accepted Jesus as their Savior. 30% of those 30 to 49 and 40% of adults 50 and older hold that belief. The gospel is very simple. Jesus died, rose again, conquered the, conquered the grave, defeated death. And if we ask him into our lives, our sins are forgiven. But somehow only 20% of Christians between the ages of 18 and 29 believe that. 65% of America considers themselves Christian. So if you take those numbers out... That means 13% of people under the age of 29 that say that they are Christians believe in the gospel. 13%. Where did they get this? They didn't get this because that's just a new thought in their head. 
They got it because that's what they've been taught is that the message doesn't matter because people are too afraid to say Jesus is the only way. There is no way but Jesus. The, the, the scripture is clear. No other name but Jesus. But we have forgotten it. it it's been totally forgotten. And then what's worse is it says, well, go back to, go back to the, the, I want to make sure I get this right. It says 40% of adults 50 and older. If you take that across the whole population, that's 26% of adults above 50 believe the gospel. So you can't say, oh, America, Christianity is the most, it's not. It's not the most prevalent idea. If you look at the age under 29, 13%, you know who else has 13% of believers that believe the gospel? Lebanon. People under the age of 29, our demographics are no different than Lebanon. Lebanon. Nothing wrong with Lebanon. I hear it's a beautiful country. According to the Bible, they have great cedars. But Lebanon and age under 29 believe the same about Christianity. We have been duped and believe something that's not the gospel. You know, Jesus says in uh, Revelation, and I won't go over the whole scripture, he's talking to the church of Ephesus, which the church of Ephesus is it is a, you know, a massive church, and, and, and it's a story where you know, he, he's talking to different churches about things going on. And the church of Ephesus is one that had lost its way because they got their eyes off of Jesus, their first love. And Jesus says, he, he says in the scripture, and you could go put it up behind me so people don't think I'm making it up. He says that this I have against you, that, that, that you lost your first love. In other words, that you lost sight of who Jesus was, and you started to do a bunch of other stuff. And then he says uh, in, in, in one of the scriptures, it's the last scripture in Revelation chapter 2, I think it's verse 7, you can put it up there. He, he says that he, he talks about all the great things they've done in verse 3, and then at the end he says that, that you have to overcome by this. Look at what it says. He says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to him who overcomes. He just said that, that, you, that I have this against you, that you've left me, you've left your first love, but then he says to him who overcomes. So the correlation is in order to overcome everything that's being thrown against us, the only way we can do that is by resting and believing the first love that we had, that's Jesus. Do you remember what it was like when you first got saved? Man, when I first got saved, I was crazier than I am right now. I'm starting to get back to that crazy, which is really scary. I feel bad for everybody, including my wife. But, you know, when I was first saved, I, 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 would, just, I would just get right in people's face. It was probably a bad thing, but, you know, you got to be a little bit rambunctious to get up and, you know, do what I do. And so here I am, and I would just tell everybody about it. Have you heard about Jesus? Have you heard about Jesus? You know, I would tip people, and I always thought it was God. You know, like, oh, you know, my bill was 10 bucks, but I'm going to leave 30. I'm going to write, Jesus loves you. And, you know, it's like all of a sudden you do that, but that's it. But you're just so consumed with Jesus, you just do whatever, right? For those of you that, you know, I, I don't know if I would suggest tipping $20 on a $10 meal, but if you really want them to know Jesus loves you, anyway, you can tip me 20 bucks if you want. And so here we are, and then we have... You know, I, I, would just, I would just go nuts. Because when you're first saved, you're not indoctrinated with all the other stuff. You only know Jesus. You haven't learned all the special ways you have to pray. But I don't see any of those ways in the Bible. I just see the Bible say, pray in Jesus' name. And then all of a sudden, you're not indoctrinated with all the ways to receive healing. Like, like really? Like, like the newest, greatest thing is, oh, you, you, you have to go and you have, to, you have to plead guilty for all your past sins to receive healing. Where is that in the Bible? Because I don't see it. I just see, oh, Jesus says I can be healed. I'm healed in Jesus' name. That's what I see. Or, or my family's a wreck, so I have to sow a special seed to bring the family back together. Where is that in the Bible? For all I know, Jesus is the one who restores the family, not the, not the seed I sow. I sow the seed because I love Jesus and because I want to contribute to his kingdom, and I'm compelled by God's spirit to give, not to get some blessing. And so this is what we see that is scriptural. But we somehow missed the mark. And I'm not saying, let me be very clear, I'm not saying Ascent Church is Mr. Mark. I'm talking about modern-day Americanized Christianity. And here we are. And Jesus says, in order to overcome, you have to rely on me, your first love. He says it in John 16, 33, another way. Because I just asked who is dealing with some troubles, and there are a lot of people. He says this in John 16, 33. In this world, you will face trials and troubles. That's, that's not a very good promise from Jesus. Like, give it to me. I'm like, you know, I was, I was taught, oh, when you come to Jesus, everything is perfect. 
You know, when you come to Jesus, nothing can happen. And then all of a sudden, Jesus says, hey, guess what? In this world, you will face some trials and troubles. And all of a sudden, it's like, what? But then look at what Jesus says next. He says, but take heart. He says, because you have overcome the world. Doesn't he say, no, he doesn't say that. He doesn't say you've overcome the world. He says, I have overcome the world. He doesn't say, he doesn't say, take heart because Zach has overcome. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say, take heart because Sarah, you've overcome. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say, take heart because faith is over. He doesn't say that. By faith, I meant my wife, not, not physical faith. And he doesn't say, he doesn't say, take heart because you have, he doesn't say that. He says, take heart because I, Jesus, have overcome the world. In other words, it's a picture of the gospel. The gospel is this simple. Your, your, your effort, nothing. You can't do anything. Jesus tells us that. It's not about what you can do. You cannot overcome the world. Your family's in trouble. Good news for you. You can do nothing. You have healing issues. You have all kind of physical ailments. Good news for you. You can do nothing. All of a sudden, you, you maybe you inherited some horrible things, some horrible situational work. Good news for you. You can do nothing. You know what I mean? Your, 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 ball or your, your family member's addicted. Good news for you. You can do absolutely nothing. But I know someone who says... He has overcome the world, and it's a picture of standing and stepping and saying, no matter what hell brings against me, no matter what comes my way, I know that Jesus died, he rose again, he lives today, and I can stand because he has overcome the world. That's what it says. Man, I get excited preaching about this. So then we got all this stuff coming against us. Be honest, anxiety, doubt, Fear, ailments, just bombard us nonstop. So Psalm 23, 5 tells us a beautiful picture. It says, He's over, He's prepared, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. You see, he says that David writes that you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. But I've heard so many people talk about what that table is. You know, that's the table of it's a table of healing, and it's a table of freedom, and it's a table of deliverance. Yeah, it is all those things. But you know what's interesting about a table is a table can get cluttered. All the books that you've read, they, they pile up on the table. All the ideas, they pile up on the table. Everything piles up on the table. Before you know it, your enemies have power because you don't even know what table you're sitting at anymore. But he says, he says I prepare a table for you. That's God's word for you today. Jesus is saying, I have prepared a table for you in the presence of your enemies. What is the table? The table is the table of the gospel. There is no other name. There is no other message. I will go to my grave. I, I would do anything. I'd look people in the face. I, I, I don't, it doesn't bother me if I offend people anymore. When I say, the only thing that matters is Jesus died, rose again, and he lives today. His blood was spilled for us that he was pierced for our transgressions, that he was bruised for our iniquities. That's the only message that matters. And wisdom comes out of that. Freedom comes out of that. Deliverance and healing come out of that. So what table? It's a table of the gospel with the bread and the wine that Jesus said that this is my bread, my body. My bread, body, you get the point. He said, this is my body which is broken for you. And then he breaks it. Why does he break it? Because his body was broken so that you could receive healing. Not because so he could give some man of God a special healing anointing. No! His body wasn't broken for that. His body wasn't broken so that somebody could take a sweat, wag, sweat rag and wipe it and throw it on somebody. My God, if you think that's the case, you should come take this shirt because it is filthy right now. Maybe there's some anointing. The only thing it's going to make you do is smell like turds afterwards. And so here in the middle of it, we see that, that God says, Jesus says, this is my body which is broken for you. It has nothing to do with man. It has nothing to do with me. It has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with Jesus. That the body was broken so that you could receive healing. That you could receive freedom. And then he says, this is the cup of the new covenant. And then he says this, of what? My blood. What, what is that for? He says that you can receive forgiveness. 
The table is full, and the presence of your enemies is full of the gospel. And the full gospel, the healing of, of, of your body and mind and emotions through the, through the body of Jesus. When, when he died on the cross and he was whipped and, and he was bruised, the, the, the healing that took place. And then the cup of victory. Baby, I, sometimes you just need to sit there at the table and you need to say, you know what, uh, the enemies are, are, are yelling, the doubt's yelling, but you know what, I know Jesus forgave me, I'm just going to drink. That is some really good 54% port wine. I'm only kidding. It's Welch's grape juice from CVS. Don't worry. Actually, it's not. It's President's Choice, so it tastes really terrible. It was worth the extra dollar for the Welch's, but I didn't want to spend it on a Sunday morning. And so here we are. Sometimes you just need to drink to it. You know what? The enemy's coming against me, but, but Jesus is my freedom. The enemy's coming. See, if this was wine, I would be really good preaching right now. I'm telling you. So you just need to say, Jesus is for me. And look, sometimes it's not just you. Sometimes it's your family. Faith, go ahead and come on up. Sometimes you need to grab your family. And you need to say, you know what? It doesn't make any sense, but, but we're going to do this. Baby, you look so good. I need to bring you up so you don't fall down. And so here we go. And so we need to bring her up. I know I'm, I'm the better looking out of the two. You don't have to tell her that. And so... Sometimes you just need to get at the table and you just need to come together and you just need to say, we don't understand what's going on. We don't understand what's happening, but we're going to believe that Jesus broke, his, his body was broken for us so we can receive healing. We can take the cup together and we can stand and believe for our family. We can stand and believe on the gospel and say nothing can come against us. The devil doesn't have it. The devil can't speak it. Not today, devil. You see, this is why the message is called This Ain't It. Because we settle for a whole bunch of stuff that we think is it that's not. If Jesus isn't preached at his healing, this ain't it. If Jesus isn't the one preaches deliverance, this ain't it. If Jesus is the one that's preached, is not the one that's preached, is the one that restores the family, this ain't it. If Jesus is not the center of a message and it all comes back to him and his gospel, that's not biblical Christianity. Biblical Christianity is real simple. It's really a religion for dumb people, and I'm glad because I'm not too smart. It's a real simple message. Jesus died. He bled. He died on a cross. He, 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 and when he died, he was put in a grave for three days. And whether you like it or not, the truth is that during those three days, he descended into the pit of hell. He took the keys of sin and death. He defeated hell. He defeated the devil. And he rose again, giving us life. That's the message to preach, baby. That's the message to believe. But I know what you're saying. Well, you just don't understand. You just don't understand what's going on. You know what? There was a lady that didn't understand in Mark chapter 5. We're not going to go to the scriptures. It's the lady with the issue of blood. She didn't understand. 12 years she's been bleeding. I can't say when I'm bleeding for 10 minutes. Can you imagine 12 years? 12 years. And the scripture tells us that she went to all the doctors and nothing worked. In fact, when she went to the doctors, it got worse. That's what the scripture tells us. It's a lot like today. Sometimes you face situations where no one knows how to help you. Doctors don't know how to help you. Counselors don't know how to help you. No one knows how to help you. And you go and it just gets worse. And then it says that she spends all of her money. She, she she's depletes herself. But then it says she heard about Jesus. When you hear about Jesus and the gospel, everything changes. And the scripture says that she ran in. She grabbed a hold of Jesus. She was healed. Church, what is it that you're facing today? Because I'm here to tell you Jesus is the one that can do it. I don't know what you're facing, but I want to tell you that the one who bruised the serpent's head in Genesis, he's there for you today, and he still bruises the serpent's head. The, the one who was with, jo with Joshua when they crossed the Jordan, and when the, the tabernacle hit the water, and it stopped, and the people walked over on dry land, that one is still with you today. The one that was with Daniel and the, and, and, and the, and the guys in the furnace, he's still with you today. The, the, the one that was with Moses on top of the mountain, he's still with you today. The one that, that Psalm says is the one that leads us by still waters, he's still with you today. The, the one that says that he's the beginning of all wisdom in Proverbs, he's still with you today. The one in Matthew that shows up as a babe in swaddling clothes, he's still with you today. And Mark, he's the healer of the blind and the lame, he's still with you today. And Luke, he's a great physician, he's still with you today. And Acts, he's the one that gives you the power of the Holy Spirit, 
He's still with you today. And Romans, Galatians, Colossians, and Corinthians, he's the greatest power of the universe, the power of love, and he is still with you today. And in and, and Titus, he's the one calling out the young men and young women to, to give them a call in the future. He's still with you today. In Hebrews, he's the one that's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's still with you today. And in Revelation, he's the beginning and the end, the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and creator of all things. He is still with you today. And his name is Jesus. He's the one that went to the cross. He's the one that bled. He's the one that died. He's the one that rose again from the grave. And he's the one that still lives today. Somebody give up and give, get up and give Jesus a shout. Get up and give Jesus a shout. He's still with you today. What is it you're facing this morning? Jesus is with you. What is it that you're looking right in the eyes? Jesus is with you. And I want to tell you something, any other message other than that. And I'm not saying that to be a, to say that I'm a, a professional on the message. I'm saying to say, I know what the scripture tells me. Any other message, that ain't it. But Jesus is. All across this room, I want you to close your eyes for a moment. There may be some people here that have never heard a message like this. I want you to know that the reason we preach the gospel is because it's what frees you of your sins. The scripture tells us that if we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth that the gospel is true, that Jesus comes and lives inside of us. So I want to give you that opportunity. With every eye, close every head bowed. If that's you and you're saying, I need Jesus in my life. I want to invite Jesus in. Just raise your hand where you're at. I want to pray with you right now. If that's you. See your hand over there. That's beautiful. See, anybody else? Anybody else? See your hand in the back. That's good. That's beautiful. This is beautiful. Now let's pray this prayer together. You see, Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross for me, that you rose again from the grave, defeating death and giving me life. So, Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Come live in my heart be the savior of my soul. In your name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, beautiful. Welcome to eternal life. God's promise for you. Faith, go ahead. You want to come up here. I want to pray for those of you that are facing some things in your life. I'm going to specifically pray for pain and some other things. So raise your hands right now. We're going to ask Jesus to do it only he can. Every time the gospel of Jesus is preached, miracles, signs, and wonders always happen. It's a guarantee from scripture. So raise your hands high. Jesus, I thank you for the opportunity to preach your gospel. And so Jesus, I thank you that you always confirm it with signs and wonders and miracles. And so in the name of Jesus, I speak to pain in the body. I, I, I speak to pain in the mind. I speak to pain and, and I say in the name of Jesus, the spirit of pain, the spirit of infirmity, the spirit affecting that person that is from the pit of hell. In the name of Jesus, come out now. Be healed in Jesus' name. Jesus is healing you right now. All across this room, from the front to the back, side to side, Jesus is with you. My hand is too small to touch you. But there's a hand touching you right now. His name is Jesus. Jesus, we thank you. In Jesus' name, you're healed. In Jesus' name, you're healed. Now begin to move your body around like you couldn't before. Just begin to move it. There, there, was, there, there was somebody whose back was healed in the last service. Someone else came up to me and said that their shoulder blade was healed. People were healed in the first. Now begin to move it right now. Begin to move that part of your body. Just, if it's in your shoulders, move it. If you couldn't bend, bend right now. If, if, you couldn't, if, you couldn't see, if you couldn't see right, take off your glasses and look around. Jesus is healing you right now. Jesus, we thank you. Now I want you to lower your hands for a moment. Who can say, I'm not going to have you come up here, but you say, I can tell Jesus did something. Raise your hand. I did just wave at me so I know. See your hand there. See your hand there. See your hand there. Your hands are up all over. This is beautiful. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you, Jesus. Now, if you just start singing Jesus, it's the only name that matters. Jesus, just, just begin to sing Jesus. Right? Oh, see Jesus sing. Jesus. Jesus, the name of John, keep 
just keep singing that while I pray. In Jesus' name, I come and I take authority over issues of the mind. I take authority over, over depression. I take authority over anxiety. In the name of Jesus, I call that spirit out now. Heal the Jesus' name. Sold the message. We thank you for we thank you for raising again from the grave, defeating death, defeating hell, defeating the devil. We thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.